Hello, I'm Rory McKiernan and welcome to the Love and Courage podcast. This is a community supported podcast made possible by donors and patrons like you. You can help the podcast grow by subscribing to it, leaving a review and a rating and by spreading the word wherever you can. You can also support by becoming a donor or a patron and receive a Love and Courage t-shirt, badge, special mentions online and discounts on future workshops and events. You can find out more at loveandcourage.org. Thanks so much for your support. It really means a lot and is hugely appreciated. I hope you enjoy the podcast. If all we did was spend our days and nights fighting, well, great. You know, it's a good cause, but, you know, what about sex, drugs, and rock and roll? <laughs> you know, what about good food and a soft bed? What about, you know, fun? So we really, we really do owe it to them, to not just to ourselves, but to the people we're trying to help. Like to do it. I'm doing it for them. I'm doing it for Jesse. I'm doing it for my parents. I'm doing it for my Uncle Joe. I mean, I lost them all while I was in there. I lost them all. And yet, um, like when I do stuff like this, I, they're here. I feel them. I really do feel them. And they're going, yeah, yeah. You know, because I give them a voice. I give them a life. I give them joy. And that's, that's my revenge. If you want. <laughs> That's my revenge, to be happy. My guest in this episode is the remarkable Sonny Jacobs, one of the most inspirational people I've ever met. Sonny spent 17 years in prison, including five in solitary confinement for a crime she didn't commit. I've been friends with Sonny for several years now and was honoured to interview her at the Krynunikoska public event in Newman Church, Dublin on Easter Monday. This was part of a series of events on the theme of freedom organised by Cathy Scott and the team at the Trailblazery. The interview starts with a longer than usual introduction which lasts for about six minutes. This will give you a lot more perspective for some of the incredible discussion that will follow. Brace yourself now for amazing insights from this incredible woman. We have roughly an hour um, which we're going to get into discussion but also really looking forward to having a a Q&A session and and hearing your thoughts and your ideas and your questions for Sonny. But we thought in the interest of time and really having a deeper conversation um, that I would relay Sonny's, some of the key points of Sonny's story um, and it it will save us some time. Now I'm saying that and I'm a little bit nervous because I can't possibly do justice to the scale and depth and I would say the severity of her story. Um, But but I'll give it a go and it, it starts really well, it obviously starts before 1976, but in 1976, which was a year before I was born, um, Sonny was a 27-year-old mother, a self-described uh, peace and love hippie, I believe, mm-hmm. um, a vegetarian, a uh, married woman, a uh, nine-year-old uh, son, Eric, 10, 10-month-old um, daughter, Christina, and through a range of decisions and circumstances, she found herself in the wrong place with the wrong people in the wrong time and that led her to get sentenced to death for the murder of two policemen wrongly. That in turn led to five years in solitary confinement in the most tiny of cells, a concrete cell with no windows, no mirrors and no light. It was the most severe of prison but it was become Sonny's sanctuary. In 1981 a courageous juror thanks to the actions of this courageous juror who refused to be bullied by the judicial system, um, Sonny's Sonny's death sentence was converted to uh, life in prison and she was then free to join the mainstream prison population. Sonny described herself in previous writings and talks as the happiest prisoner in the prison. (laughs) And it was because that prison had become the sanctuary that she had taught herself that, which is what the discussion will get into. Just one year later, her parents had been uh, the carers of her two small children. And because they had the carers and because Sonny was on death row, essentially, um, the parents couldn't take time off, couldn't have holidays. But because she was now in life in prison, the parents felt that there was a certain degree of freedom to go on holidays. And they set off on a holiday to Las Vegas and tragedy struck again when the plane crashed and both her parents were killed just a year after joining the the mainstream prison. So Sonny was to become an orphan and as were her children who were then sent into the care system. 
We'll talk more in detail about her experiences in prison shortly. And then in the 15th year of her time in prison, Sonny's husband, Jesse, who had also been sentenced to prison, was executed in a botched attempt that took three attempts to kill him. And apologies for going into the detail, but there were flames coming out of his hair and smoke coming out of his ears. And the reason I relay that now is because in Arkansas and throughout the US right now and throughout many countries in the world, the death penalty still exists and we shouldn't hide away from the reality of that. Sonny's legal team and her friends refused to give up hope. They believed in her and eventually, and thanks to Sonny's courageous conviction and uh, determination to be free, in 1992, uh, she finally won her freedom. Mm. However, she was, at the, she was then aged 45. Mm. She'd entered prison at the age of 27. She was now 45. The world had changed dramatically. <laughs> she didn't know what an ATM machine was. <laughs> that was my favorite thing. <laughs> <laughs> Free money, yeah? Well, I thought so for a while. <laughs> it's a bit like cash back. It, it doesn't exist. Um, Sonny had lost those valuable years as a mother valuable years as a friend, as a wife, valuable years of what might have been a career. Mm -hmm. And she arrived into the world with no money and only a cardboard box. The world had changed massively and she set about rebuilding her life, investing in her family, investing in her children. Um, there was a car crash as well, I believe, Sonny, and, and that's partially... And five years later. Five years later, which is one of the reasons you see Sonny arriving here in a, in a wheelchair, essentially, today, and that she didn't have health insurance. And again, that's another so social reality for many people in the US and around the world. Um, so tragedy was never to leave her alone, but she kept fighting, investing in her kids, and trying to teach a message of forgiveness, something that she had learned um, during those years in prison. This led her to become a campaigner and an activist rather than a victim. She decided to take her own story to the US and to the world. And the winds of change and the winds of campaigning blew her into the wild west of Ireland, <laughs> into Galway, and to an Amnesty International conference where a sparkly-eyed man named Peter, who's seated here in front of us, uh, was to meet her and catch her attention. Mm -hmm. And the two of them got talking about their shared experiences in prison and their shared investment in yoga and meditation as tools for healing and tools for survival in life. So Sonny and Peter went on to get married in a private winter solstice <laughs> ceremony, which nobody knew about until I read about it in the New York Times. Uh, and in fact, they got it's legally private. married just a few years ago in New York in a wedding, a high society wedding of sorts, a low budget high society yeah. wedding that was featured in the New York Times in the kind of society pages. <laughs> and uh, Sonny was proud to inform me that she was wearing a $10 dress and, and Peter was wearing Penny's Finest. But I can assure you, if you Google Sonny and Peter New York wedding, New York Times, they look every bit a million dollars in that, mm -hmm. in that photo. So her story has been written by herself, of course, in, in her books, in her memoir, Stolen Time. And uh, it's featured in the play and the film, The Exonerated, in which Mia Farrow and Susan Sarandon plays Sonny. Today, Sonny and Peter travel the world um, campaigning against the death penalty and helping other people in need. And they've set up the Sonny Sanctuary, a sanctuary for uh, exonerees and people who need refuge after they leave prison, which we'll talk about shortly. So she's an incredibly important messenger, messenger for freedom, for justice, for love and for courage in today's world and it's such a special um, it, it's such a special thing to be here with you today Sonny and uh, you just bring life wherever you go in the same way the flowers bring life to you, you it, I wish we could be in churches like this every Monday and hear from people like you and uh, just thanks so much for joining us and, and we'll just kick into the conversation okay um, so I hope I've done some justice to that but it's 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 you know, I've heard your story many times, Sonny, and I was reading it again last night, and I was just struck. And, you know, I, I, I was just left going, how is she smiling? And, and that would be my main question. And, and I know you've found peace and found freedom in yourself, but maybe let's start with the question for you, what, what is freedom? Because this event is, is about the theme of freedom. Yeah, well, actually, I've struggled with that question myself, obviously, for a long time. Um, in the beginning, 
um, freedom was about how do I get out of this prison, <laughs> you know? Um, when this first happened to me, I, I, I didn't actually take it maybe as seriously as I should have because I, I knew they just made a mistake and when I explained and they were able to listen because they were so angry because of the two policemen being killed that they weren't really listening to anything. So but I, I could understand that, but I thought in time they would understand that I would never kill anybody. And I mean, I'm a vegetarian, you know, like I don't even eat meat, so I'm like not gonna be killing people, you know, and hippie and all that. So. Um, I just thought, I believed in um, truth, justice, and the American way, and all that stuff that you hear on Superman, and you know, I believed it. And uh, so I went to court with that attitude, and when uh, things went the, when the, the way they went, I was totally unprepared for that. And I ended up then in my own private death row because there were no other women sentenced to death at that time. So. Um, I, I was in complete isolation and solitary confinement for the entire five years that I had the death sentence. And so at that point in time, um, freedom to me was just being released from that whole situation, getting out of the cell and then being released from prison and then going home to my family. That's what freedom was to me. Um, but that there are so many kinds of freedom I now know that um, that's a very sort of surface kind of freedom. Um, and that didn't happen for a very long time. And so I started having to go deeper into myself. And the question of freedom became more of an internal question. Uh, until finally I realized one day, and it was, I should say, in, especially in this place, that it was because of, I only had two books in my cell. Uh, my cell was six steps from the solid metal door to the toilet sink thing. And if I reached out my arms like this, I could touch both walls. There was a, a, uh, a metal shelf on one side with a thin mattress. And um, that's all. There was no chair or table, nothing. That's all that was in my cell except for two books, a law book and a Bible. The law book at that point in time was totally useless to me because it's another language entirely. And I had no use for the law at that point anyway, because they got it all wrong. And the Bible was a book of wisdom. And at that point in time, I was questioning whether there even was God at all, because <coughs> how could God let this happen? Not just to me, but to my whole family. My nine-year-old son was held in juvenile detention for over two months until my parents were able to convince a judge to release him into their custody. My 10-month-old daughter, who was still nursing at the time, was held for two weeks, and we weren't even allowed to be in contact with the people holding her to explain that she didn't know how to use a bottle because I'd been nursing. Uh, so uh, uh, the, this tragedy happens to the entire family. and. I had never hurt anybody in my whole life. Maybe hurt somebody's feelings, but I had never actually hurt a person. I couldn't understand how that could happen. But I realized at this one point, I, there was something I read in the Bible that told me that they don't really get to say when I die. That's not really up to them. And so I started thinking that what they wanted me to believe was that my situation was hopeless. And I was just there waiting for them to decide when to take my life. But I decided I would rather believe in hope. And in order to do that, I had to then make my peace with God because otherwise it really was hopeless. <laughs> if there wasn't any God, then I was, they, were the, they were the end of the line. And so I had a serious discussion with God. Who was God to you at that time? Did you have a religious or a spiritual you know, background? Well, I brought, I've been brought up in the Judeo-Christian you know, religion and ethic. Um, but we weren't very religious, so you know, we, we did the holidays. Uh, but um, I wasn't sure. You know, God was this energy all around somehow. It wasn't a man or a woman. God, it was in me and in you and all around. So I just thought of God as an energy, but, but one I could talk to. We had discussions. And so um, <laughs> was, God was like I liked. I wished I could be. Like if I didn't have a body, I could just leave. 
So um, once I settled that question for myself, then I realized that until they did either realize that they made a mistake and release me, or for some strange reason of my karma, uh, take my life, something I didn't do, um, the best thing I could do was to become the best person that I could be. So that um, when they released me, I would still have something left inside me to give to my children. And if it was going to go the other way, then it was still the best thing I could do to become the best person I could be. So that when I went up there, I could answer for myself. It must have took you some time to arrive at that, though, because you had five years in solitary, and I'm wondering no, what that, that did you decide that early? No, that happened in a few months. Okay. Because I got sick of myself. Because, like, all I did in the first weeks was to pace back and forth the six steps, angry, confused, frightened. I mean, I was all alone in this building. There was not another person, no other prisoner in the building where I was held. Uh, there was just a guard up in the office in the front and me, and no other prisoner was allowed to communicate with me in any way, so I was truly isolated. And um, after, I, I didn't get any phone calls or visits or even letters in the beginning. And so I, I was sort of got sick of myself, like, you know, who wants to live the rest of your life with somebody who's angry and, and scared and confused? You know, it just was like, I just got sick of it. And so then when I read this in the Bible, I was like, yes, this is the way. So I had my discussion, you know, how could you do this? I mean, you know, and then um, <laughs> we decided that the best thing I could do was to, to turn my cell into a sanctuary. I mean, I didn't have to look at it from their point of view. Their point of view, I was locked up in this dungeon waiting for my life to be taken from me. But actually, in looking at it from a different way, it was a wonderful opportunity for me to do my spiritual work because I was excused from work. I didn't have anybody to take care of. I didn't have to cook or clean or, or, or do, do anything except for the first time in my life, I had servants even. <laughs> wow, didn't they cook for me? They came and got my dishes and washed them for me. They did my laundry. I had free electricity. <laughs> so it all depends, you know, and I realized there was a big trick that they had played on me that I didn't have to see it their way at all. There was another way to see it. And until such time as they, as I said, realized they made a mistake or killed me, my life still belonged to me, and I didn't have to leave it in misery. And so I decided that it was a good opportunity, and um, uh, because before that I was always busy either taking care of the kids or my husband and the house and, and working. So I decided I would do yoga, meditation, and prayer, and that um, I would never be bored. I was never count the bricks in the walls. Um, I did mathematical problems in my head. I thought of recipes that I would cook for my children when I got home. And my, it actually transformed my life. I think I actually learned more about freedom during that time than I ever knew before. Because I found a different kind of freedom. I couldn't leave the cell, okay? So you are, in a way, a prisoner of your circumstances to an extent, always, you know? And, um, and five years after I got out, the same thing. It's the same story. Uh, as I flew through the air, the car hit me, and I was flying through the air like, this isn't supposed to happen to me. I already had my test, didn't I? And then afterwards, the injury caused me, over time, to be less and less uh, able to walk. And that's another type of freedom taken away from me, the freedom to move around freely, and yet, Again, it made me go deep inside again and appreciate the freedom that I really do have and where freedom really does begin and end. Is a big part of that the freedom to decide how you, like the decision in that moment that there's something I'm getting at around being a victim mm. and you chose not to be a victim of, of those, some of those experiences, even that car crash. Yeah. Like at what point does a person have enough? I guess that's pretty individual, but yeah. um, th there's always, you always have a choice. No matter how um, limited, there's always a choice, even when they just brought the food on the tray and you couldn't even recognize what it was usually. 
um, you could choose whether or not to eat it. So there's, there's always a choice mm. and there's a certain freedom in mm. that. Once you re recognize that, there's always this very core, this essence of freedom that you can uh, draw on to get through anything. I'm, I'm guessing you experienced the opposite where other prisoners didn't see things the same way as you did and perhaps went into themselves. And... Yeah, well, there weren't any other prisoners well, in well, my yeah, after but the, after the five afterwards. Year period. And actually, sometimes, every once in a while, this part of the prison, it was a separate unit that was used for, um, like, if there was a riot or something in the prison or if, if someone had become violent towards themselves or other people, they would put them in this building where I was. And occasionally, I, they, would, they would put someone else in there. Um, but the only people that I met in those circumstances were um, going through some sort of a, an emotional upheaval or maybe were mentally ill. There's a lot of mentally ill people in prison. And um, so they might be self-harming or um, like one woman... Um, kept swallowing things so that they would have to take her out of the cell in order to get a break from being in the cell. Whereas for me, I just meditated, you know? And then I, I could leave. Every night at 11 o'clock, at certain times of the day, and, and, a, and specifically at 11 o'clock each night, they have what they call count time in the prison. All prisons have count time. And um, at 11, they would have count time, and everybody had to be, apparently, I, I knew this later, but you, they would come around and count. And um, when I went into the population after I was released from the death sentence, um, that would be the quietest time, you know, because you all had to be quiet and sit on your bed. And so that's when I would meditate, and I would send myself, my spirit out. And I'd, we'd swore, Jesse and I would swirl around somewhere in the atmosphere together. And then I'd go and I'd, I'd swirl around my children. And, and in that way, I could be with them. And um, so that was another kind of freedom. Did you have any contact with Jesse and with your children or anybody at that point? No, no. Not when I was first in the death sentence, no. It took a number of months. Um, before I was allowed, well, it was weeks before I even got a, um, a letter. And finally, I was allowed to get letters from my parents, and at least I knew the children were okay, and they were with my parents, so I knew that was fine. Um, and then I started getting letters from Jesse, and he would try to, you know, cheer me up and tell me everything was going to be okay and that kind of thing, and, so, and that helped a lot, too. And he helped me with my um, meditation. You know, he had been doing meditation as well. So um, I remember one time he sent me a circle that he had drawn for me. And he told me, just stare into the circle. And I found it very difficult at first, you know. And even though there were no distractions, because there was absolutely nobody else in the building, it, I, I was my own distraction, you know. So it took me a while to learn how to kind of <coughs> Um, get beyond all those feelings and, and find a, a, a mm. place of peace in myself. And that was key. And that lasted me all through the rest of the years, and even to this day. See, I thought, even in prison, after having done all this and found out about the inner peaceful place and the inner freedom that you can find, I still was under the misconception that Freedom would, would happen when I was free, when they released me, then I'd be free. And that's what I kept looking for and, and working towards all those years. And then finally, I was free. And I didn't know what to do. I had no idea what to do next. I wasn't, freedom was overwhelming, like, Okay, now what do I do with it? And so um, it was an interest, a really interesting moment because now they, they released me. Finally, I was released from prison. And I just stood there with the cardboard box that you mentioned that had in, all my possessions in the world. I went in when I was 27. I came out, I was 45. I owned six pairs of underwear, six pairs of socks, uh, two bras, two white shirts, and two pairs of jeans and two pairs of shoes and a Walkman radio. 
Hmm? That's all I owned in the whole world. And um, I, I had no money. I had no identification. I had no place to go. My parents were gone. I didn't have a home to go back to. And my children by then had grown up with the foster families and were, um, my son was out on his own and actually by then had a three and a half year old daughter of his own, was living in a different state. And my daughter, after her father was executed, she was about 15 when he was executed. And when she heard how terrible it was, she tried to take her own life. And so the foster family that had uh, custody of her decided to send her to a school for children with emotional and behavioral problems because they didn't know what to do. And so she was locked up in a school uh, for where I wasn't allowed even to communicate with her by letters anymore. I wasn't even allowed to write to her. And she was locked up until she was 18 years old. So um, when I got out, she was stuck in that school. I wasn't even allowed to communicate with her. And so I stood there with my little cardboard box. And finally, I decided, since nobody yelled at me and nobody shot at me, that maybe it was OK to take a few steps around. I put the cardboard box down and saw a, a stairway. And I decided to go down the stairway, and I found I was in the street, and it was just me and the sun and the moon. It was that time of day when the sun and the moon were out together, and I just started to run, <laughs> and I ran, and I ran, and it was, the, it was the most beautiful moment, I think, of my entire life. I just ran, and it was just me and the sun and the moon and the wind, until all of a sudden, a car stopped in the middle of the road. A man jumped out and said, are you Sonny Jacobs? Uh, uh, Sonia Jacobs, he said. And I said, yeah? Like, how did he know? <laughs> Santa Claus? And, and he said, well, there's some people looking for you back there. And he pointed in, in the direction, actually, that I was running. I was like, oh, OK. And I ran. And what had happened is I ran. I had run around the block. I had no idea. I was just, uh, and I ran around the, like, where he showed me, and I, there was the stairway again. So I went up, and there was my one of my lawyers and a friend who had helped me in the end, you know, joined forces with the lawyers. And um, I tried to go back in the building, but my body would not allow me to pass the threshold. I couldn't go back in. And um, so I called in the door when someone came out and they ran out to me. And, and then the next chapter of my life actually began. But during that moment, I think that's the most free that I've ever, ever been before or since. <laughs> because then all of a sudden, the, the, the responsibilities of freedom entered into the picture. You know, like, freedom isn't free. You know, it comes with responsibility. And, okay, now I'm free, so where am I going to eat? Like, who's going to feed me? So where did you end up living at that point then? Well, I didn't know. I had no idea. I had no plan. I just needed to be free. I didn't understand that that meant I wasn't going to have a place to sleep that night. You know? As this, at this point, because the state weren't necessarily looking after you, they just dumped you out into the street. Not, with not and, a penny. And is this where lawyers and friends came in? How did you kind of get to the next point? Because well, of, sorry. yeah, yeah. No, um, the lawyers, she, she, well, she picked, we went in her car, and they handed me a telephone in the car, which was very strange, because when I went into the prison, they didn't have telephones in cars. And <laughs> they had long curly wires that got all wound up. And so um, they handed me a phone and said I could call my son. Oh, OK. And so um, I called him and let him know that I was free, because this happened kind of unexpectedly at a hearing. And uh, I then um, they took me to my lawyer's house, and she told me I could pick anything I wanted out of her closet to wear. Of course, she was like six feet tall, so 
I picked a pair of shorts <laughs> and a t-shirt with a flamingo on it. <laughs> and um, they had asked me what I wanted to eat. God, I had dreamed about so many. In the beginning, I dreamed about all these amazing things, very complex dishes. But in the end, it was like a potato, maybe, <laughs> you know? Or I, I remember I had a list. Everybody has a list when they get out of prison of the things they want to do. And my list was, uh, number one was uh, a bubble bath. Because mm. there are no bathtubs in prison. And then number two was a Thomas's English muffin with real butter. And number three was a uh, man. <laughs> <You know. laughs> and it took me actually three years before I even went on a date, and that was on a bicycle because I didn't trust anybody. So I wasn't going to get stuck in somebody's car. But um, uh, so I got the bubble bath at the uh, lawyer's house, and um, then they ordered Chinese food. I decided that's what I wanted, Chinese food and chopsticks. And um, then um, the, the uh, following morning, they took me to a big hotel, and we had a sleepover with friends that, pe some of the women that I'd known from the prison, and Jessie's mom was there, and she brought me a pair of pajamas. She's the only one who like understood to any extent, you know, that I, 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 I wouldn't be prepared for anything. And, um, then the next morning, they took me to the restaurant in the hotel, and they gave me this menu, page and page. It was like a novel, you know. And I couldn't possibly, I mean, it would be tomorrow breakfast time before I could possibly read all those things and make the choice. And so I saw um, uh, this omelet. It had all kinds of things in it on the menu, and I said, would it be... Could I change my mind? Could I change my mind and not have the Thomas's English muffin and butter now? And they were like, yes, you can have whatever you want. But, you know, in prison, you don't have a lot of choices. So I wasn't sure I was allowed to change my mind. And if I did change my mind, if I could still get the Thomas's English muffin and butter the next day, because, again, in prison, if you got the opportunity to have something, you had to take it right away because that opportunity was not coming back. So they said, yes, yes, you can have whatever you want. So I had the omelet, just that, having a little faith that maybe I could have my Thomas's English muffin still. And, um, and then I wanted to go to the sea. It was really important for me to go to the sea because I felt that the ocean was the only thing powerful enough to wash away the, the prison, the, just the whole feeling of it and just neutralize the energy. And, and, and I could like be born again, like a selkie almost. And so um, right after breakfast, I, they took me to the sea. And I just ran. I ran and ran and ran along the shore. And then I ran into the water and just let the sea wash it all away. It was, it was really beautiful. And it's important. I think sim symbolism is really important to us. It's part of our nature. You know, it's like when you see those pictures of the soldiers fighting, you know, for some unknown reason on some little island or something, and then they, they, they get the flag and they post the flag up on the top of the hill and they're renewed and, and it gives them, you know, the impetus to go on. That's a symbol. It's, it, they're really, really important. And so um, symbolically, that washing away the, the energy of the prison and the sea was really important for me. And uh, from there, I just went on to create my new life. Can you talk about how you re-entered the workforce? Because there's an interesting story there about how your practice in prison led to employment. Well, yeah, nobody was going to hire me. I mean, okay, well, okay. I was wrongly imprisoned at the age of 27 for something I didn't do. And 17 years later, I finally was released when I'm 45. So how does a 45-year-old woman get a job? You know, nobody's really hiring 45-year-old women. And then I tell them, well, what my work experience. Well, you see, <laughs> but I was innocent. Oh, yes, well, we don't call us. We'll call you, you know. Right. Uh, so um, 
the only thing I really knew how to do was yoga. Because all during the time that I was sentenced to death in the death cell, all during the time that I was in prison, I did yoga and meditation. And that helped me. And in fact, when I was released from the death cell into the population, the other prisoners used to ask me, well, how did you manage to you know, keep your health and your sanity? I'm not sure I kept my sanity, but um, you know, be, because I was locked in this little cell for, for years. And I only got out of my cell twice a week, by the way. Not one, uh, one, year, one hour a day. I only got out of my cell twice a week for a brief shower, and then about 15 minutes outside in a courtyard with a guard who didn't speak to me. And then I was put back in my cell for another three or four days. So um, uh, the other prisoners knew this, and they were amazed that I came out fit pretty healthy. And so they would ask me, and I'd say, well, meet me on Saturday, and I'll show you. And so we started doing yoga, and it ended up to be kind of a yoga class. And then after about another 10 years, <laughs> the prison noticed that we had a yoga class. <laughs> and, and so they brought in a, um, uh, a woman from the local community college to teach yoga. And up until then, I really wasn't quite sure that I was doing it right, but I knew it worked for me. And when I got out of the um, uh, death cell and I was in the population, I could go to the library and, and get yoga books. So I got a, a yoga book and I, I just did what it said in the yoga book and it seemed to work. And see, I was doing it very internally. I wasn't looking in the mirror saying, that looks right. You know, I was, I, I was feeling it inside and going, that feels right. You know, so you could feel it. it was more what I felt inside me happening rather than what I could see outside me. And so um, when this teacher came in, we, we found out we, we were doing it right. And in fact, she was so impressed with what we were doing that she brought in the Swami, Swami Naranda. How a Swami ended up in um, Broward County, Florida, I'm not quite sure, but there she was. And um, so she came in once a month. She brought in a vegetarian feast. And loads of prisoners came because if you want prisoners to attend anything, you just bring food. <laughs> you know, it's sort of like being in college. You know, <laughs> just offer food and you get a whole crowd. So um, we, we had a, 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 every, every month she'd come in, she'd bring the vegetarian feast, and we'd do yoga and meditation, and she'd teach us... Um, various things, and she would use me as her demonstrator model. So um, that was her way of fine-tuning my own practice. So when I got out, that's what I knew how to do. And it's what kept me healthy through all the most difficult times of my life, and getting my freedom was one of the most difficult times in my life as well. So um, I decided that I would teach yoga, and that would help me to get through this, the difficulties, and also it would be a way for me to share what, the way this, that I knew that could help other people with their difficulties. Because when I first got out, I didn't realize that, I didn't think I had anything in common with anyone else. You know, my, my experience had been so different than everybody else my age. And, but then after being out for a while, I realized that you know, everybody has their own prison of sorts, you know, and their own challenges. And they could use the same tools as I did to get through their challenges. So uh, it became a way of uh, sharing and a way of connecting because the thing that's missing uh, for, for anyone, I think, that's been locked away for whatever reason, guilty or not, is the connection back into the community and um, there are people here in Ireland, as a matter of fact, who have had this happen to them who have been wrongly convicted. Not as many as in America, but, uh, you know, there aren't as many people in this country as there are in New York City. So, you know, it's such a vast place. But, but uh, comparatively, we have our population of people who are wrongly convicted as well. And they find it very difficult to re-enter society because they have this stigma, uh, you know, People say, well, you know, I don't know. 
You know, maybe, I mean, they did say she did it, and you know, maybe it was a technicality, or maybe, um, isn't that the woman, isn't that the woman who's accused, and this is often the case, of killing her child? Because most of the women that I know that were wrongly convicted were con wrongly convicted of killing their own child. And so people point, they actually point at them and say, isn't that the woman, isn't that the mother of the woman that was accused of, you know? And, and it's very hard for them to get past this stigma. So um, it didn't happen for me. I kind of did it for myself. But I now know that it's important for people to welcome uh, someone in, like who has that problem in, back into their society. I think even if they were guilty, if they paid their price to society, give them a chance to have a good life, to be part of society. Maybe the whole reason why they went wrong in the first place is because they were on the fringes of society. So I think that it's up to church groups and community groups to invite these people back in and you know give them a chance to belong. And because it's not just, again, the person, it's the whole family. My family had to move after this happened to me because they, it was so, they were so devastated and so embarrassed. And my son, when they finally did get him released into my parents' custody, they, I found out way, oh, years and years later that he had to fight every day in school because the kids, who can be kind of mean, you know, they would say, oh, your mom's a murderer and she's going to die in the electric chair, you know, so he would fight. And he was a very gentle person, and so this was terrible for him. So they actually had to move. So um, when tragedy happens, and especially an injustice, it happens to the whole family. And um, I think as a society, we, have, we should be aware of that. Mm -hmm. At what point did you decide to become a campaigner or an activist? Because you could have chosen to get on with your life. You didn't owe the world anything necessarily. Yeah. Um, I think uh, I, now that there's a, this uh, phenomenon called the Innocence Projects, and um, they've been working to free people who were wrongly convicted, like myself, like Peter. And um, as a result, it's really raised awareness about the problem. And I find now that many, if not most, of the people who were wrongly convicted when they get out want to do something to help because they know others who are in prison who are also wrongly convicted, and they know how it feels and they know how it affects the families. And so um, a lot of them do try to become activists, but um, activism comes with a price. You know, activism is a great thing to do, but then um, you have to be able to, at some point, separate yourself from your activism and say, you know what? For all the people that I'm trying to help, and I had to learn this myself, for all the people that I'm trying to help that I've left behind that I think need my help, um, I, I owe it to them to enjoy my life. Because if all you do is fight, 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 then what about enjoy, 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 you know? And it's hard to enjoy when you know other people are suffering, but it's exactly for that reason that you need to enjoy, because they wish they had five minutes of your life. They, if they could just have a little bit of what you have, they'd be so happy. And so for you to waste it is a sin. You know, to waste the opportunity. In 24 hours of a day, you can fight. Let's say you fight for 18 hours of that day. Take one hour, one hour to just purely enjoy what you have, the privileges you have, the freedom you have, the opportunities that you have. And, and that's not just for you, that's for them. Because they see, they see that. They see those people that I left behind in the prison, the people that now are just being released who were wrongly convicted. They see that, look at Sonny and Peter, why they have a beautiful life. It is possible. We, we have that to aspire to, to, to hope for, you know? So at the very least, what we do is we give people hope that maybe they can have that too. If all we did was spend our days and nights fighting, well, great. You know, it's a good cause, but, you know, what about sex, drugs, and rock and roll? <laughs> you know, what about good food and a soft bed? What about, you know, 
fun. So we really, we really do owe it to them, to not just to ourselves, but to the people we're trying to help. Like to do it. I'm doing it for them. I'm doing it for Jesse. I'm doing it for my parents. I'm doing it for my Uncle Joe. I mean, I lost them all while I was in there. I lost them all. And yet, um, like when I do stuff like this, I, they're here. I feel them. I really do feel them. And they're going, yeah, yeah. You know, because I give them a voice. I give them a life. I give them joy. And that's, that's my revenge. If, if, if you want. <laughs> That's my revenge, to be happy. <laughs> um, I just want to do a time check. Who, who's on the time? Well, we can hang are, out are we okay for, for all a while? Day. Okay. Only five? I just, we're, we're going to open up a questions. I just want <laughs> you to tell people a little bit about your current life and your current work oh, yeah. and, really and maybe a little bit about the goats and the various animals yeah. And then you can ask involved. questions. <laughs> so, so, yeah, if you tell us about life in Connemara and particularly then the Sunny Sanctuary, the well, Sunny Centre. I should tell you that um, when I first came over here, and this is relevant because of tonight, when I first came over here, it was a bank holiday weekend, and so um, I, I, Amnesty International brought me over. And so I got to take the, the bus, the bus tour of, of Dublin, but I heard about Kilmainham Jail, and it's not on the bus tour. And so I got off the bus, and I went to go see Kilmainham Jail. And um, I, I realized then that, because I hadn't been in a prison again since <laughs> I got out, and uh, um, I realized that the cell looked just the same size as the cell that I had been in on death row. But I couldn't, again, it was one of those times when I couldn't make myself go in. So my friend Trish, she had her two children with us on the little tour. So I said, hey kids, you wanna go in there? You know? And they went in, so when they went in, I, I was able to go, like broke the spell. You know? But it was exactly the same size. Um, as my cell, all cells like that, I think, are pretty much the same. So when um, I met Peter, uh, I didn't know anything about, it was Steve Earle, the Galway girl, the original Galway girl. Uh, are you so, the Galway girl? Please? No, no, but I know who she is. <laughs> <laughs> she's in, uh, uh, she in, um, she's in his uh, video. Okay. So there's a hint. But anyway, and she has long black hair and blue eyes, just like the song. Anyway, Steve um, is an activist, and he told me that when I went to Ireland, I should meet Peter Pringle, because he knew that Peter had also been a person who was wrongly convicted and sentenced to death for killing of two policemen that he didn't do, which was pretty coincidental. And so, yeah. And so um, when I came over, I, I, I got in touch with him, and he came to my talk, and like he is now. <laughs> and um, then finally he told me about you know, his circumstances. I found out he did yoga and meditation as well, which was pretty interesting because you don't met, meet many guys who tell you they did yoga and meditation while sentenced to death for something they didn't do. It's not on Tinder, that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, that's what started this whole thing. And that wasn't exactly what, I mean, that gave us a connection, but that wasn't what um, really connected us. It was the yoga and meditation connected us on one le another level very closely. But it was that he said to me after that first meeting, uh, he said, um, I, I try to lead an honorable life. And that clicked for me because by then I had no time for nonsense, you know? You just don't, not when you've been through all that. You just don't have time for you know, all that stupidity. So that's what attracted me. And then um, we became friends and more than friends, as Peter always says. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, um, and then we realized that we had become part of each other's healing. And we, had, we were in a special position, like we'd been given a gift. In all of this, there was a gift, and the gift was to be able to help other people who were in a similar situation to find healing, or at least find hope that there could be happiness afterwards. And so um, it sort of happened organically, 
a young uh, Irish lawyer named uh, Neve, uh, Neve Gunn. She had been working with one of the Innocence Projects in America and had helped free this man uh, in Detroit. And he was having a lot of trouble after becoming free because like us, he found out that freedom isn't, you know, just whoopee, now I'm free. And so um, she asked if she could send him to us. And he, he spent a month living with us in our little cottage in Connemara. And um, he was, it helped him a lot. He went back and he was doing much better. So that's how it began. And um, we were too old to have children of our own, so we have kids. Meh. <laughs> sure, they all call me meh. <laughs> how many animals do you have in total? Now I'm even grand meh. <laughs> <laughs> So, so you, you live in the, the wild west of Connemara yeah. and, and you run what is the Sunny Centre, which has now received many people over the last couple of years, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And we now have a foundation based in New York uh, and um, a board and all this kind of stuff. And it's really, uh, we, we find, uh, overwhelmed our lives. But at least for the next five years, we're going to continue to do it the way we do. And we're hoping that we can train others to do what we do, other exonerees that uh, have come through our program. And then maybe they can uh, continue the work and we can kind of be consultants and just get our nice, quiet life back <laughs> in our old age. But um, it's, it's a beautiful thing to be able to do. And to see people come, they can't even look up they keep their head down like when they come. And then after a while, you can see their face and they start to smile and they start to participate. And it's a beautiful thing. And we use our neighbors to help us too. Um, when we find out what the person is, inter their interests are, like art or music or bicycle riding or whatever it might be, and we introduce them to local people who have the same interests. And they go on, go on, spend the day. You know, this is our friend John. Go on now. And <laughs> yeah, and they, they don't know necessarily, we don't tell them their background or anything. Yeah. This is our friend John from America. <laughs> and he becomes Sean, and off you go. And, and, and it's a beautiful thing, and they learn that they can, re they can connect with people on another level, that they're not just their past. Mm. Because in America, mainly they're, um, they're used, they have no way to get a job, like me. They have no way to make money or get a job. They live in such poverty. The only way they can really get a break is by talking about their experience and being used by the activist movement against the death penalty um, for that purpose. But they are being used. And it's really, after a while, not very healthy. Because it's keeping them in that box and being a, a, a victim. And so what we do is we bring them here and set them free. And now, if you want to go back into that box every once in a while, you can. But that's not who you are. Thanks, Sunny. Um, I think we'll give her a round of applause for that. <laughs> I'm going to have to be a little bit cruel because I know there's many people who want to ask questions, but I, I intentionally allowed the, the wisdom to flow this direction. Uh, but if there's anybody that really, really, really wants to ask a question. <laughs> oh, do. Uh, Tracy, you're up. And I'll give another hand you and you. I'll try. I can't promise, but sorry. Tracy, go what for it. What time is it? Uh, we have 10 minutes. There are bosses in the background hovering here. I'll repeat, okay, I'll, I'll repeat the question. I'll repeat the question. Once we hear it. So at one point you said that you, um, you had no trust in anybody after you came out of prison. So what was it that led you to come to trust people again? How did you regain trust in people? Because at one point you said you no longer trusted right. people. I still have trust issues. <laughs> but in this world, <laughs> I think they're justified. But... Um, uh, um, it was a gradual process. And um, what I do is I go back down into myself. Sometimes I, my immediate reaction is visceral, you know. And then I do breath. You can do it in one breath if you practice enough. And I get rid of that. 
And I go, okay, what does my heart say? What does my tummy say? And if it feels okay, I go with it. And if it doesn't, if, it, if, if, if it's something that I wouldn't normally, you know, like it doesn't fit me, I, I don't do it. And if it does, I do. And I'm willing to take a chance because I found that, and this is really important, being hard, you break, okay? Hard things break. But if you can be soft, then you can flow like the water and like the wind. And they're much more powerful than anything hard and rigid. So I found that I am more powerful as a soft flowing being than I am as a hard rigid being. So I know that, okay, I can handle it. You know, if I'm wrong and I get hurt, I can recover. I know that I can do that. So this gives me strength. And so I'm, I'm more able to trust now than I used to, but it's still an issue. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> uh, yourself down the back. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, do you think that there is such a thing as collective freedom, or can freedom only be a personal journey? So do you believe in collective freedom, or do you think it's only a personal journey? Oh, no, it's both. Almost oh, definitely. Freedom is so complex. I mean, freedom starts and ends with that little kernel inside of yourself. You, only you can set yourself free in the end or imprison yourself in the end, regardless of what else is going on around. But then there's physical freedom and mental freedom and emotional freedom, and all of us are connected in that way. So there is, I think, we can share our freedom. I can, I'm doing it now. We're sharing freedom right now, you know? The freedom to be here, the freedom to listen, the freedom to, to take this in, the freedom to connect with each other, uh, the freedom to change, the freedom to share. So um, I do think that um, there is a collective freedom. Uh, yeah, but we have to recognize it. I'm going to go with you, and, that, and we're going to have to wrap it then. Sorry to the others. So um, when you mentioned about being solitary, and you said that within a few months you made that decision to become the best that you could be but in a way you've kind of presented it as if it was, oh, I made that decision, and then you could kind of cope with things. But I'm imagining that the intensity of the fear and the loss, the whole loss and everything, was it like a, a toing and foring? Was it, I mean, it's, I'm assuming it was very challenging to be able to, to be like that. There must have been so much trauma. There was, there is, <clears throat> there still is. Um, <clears throat> the decision, is instant, but the process continues even to this day, you know? So like when I hear that my son is having trouble finding a job, and I know it's because, because of his treatment in the um, juvenile detention center, um, he, he was so traumatized that he developed a speech impediment. And, and when he gets nervous, he stutters. And I know that when he goes for a job, that affects his possibilities. And that makes me angry again. And I have to practice forgiveness again because that doesn't help me or anyone for me to you take on that anger again. And so it's a process that continues to this day. But, but the decision is an instant and it changes your life. Forgiveness is one of the key tools to happiness. Thanks, Sonny. Thanks for that question. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Love and Courage podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. I'd really love if you could subscribe to the podcast, rate it and review it and spread the word on social media and wherever you can. While I love doing these interviews, they take a lot of time and effort in research, production, post-production and publicity and there are some costs involved. If you would like to chip in and help the podcast grow, it would be really appreciated. All contributions welcome and monthly patrons can receive a Love and Courage t-shirt, 
badge, special mentions online and discounts on future workshops and events. And this support helps me to help others in the community in my day to day work. My sincere thanks to all of you who have already supported in so many different ways. Also, just to say, I sometimes take on social change media, communications campaigns and strategic projects and do talks and presentations, workshops in schools and colleges, community centres and at conferences. Topics range from mental health and personal development to youth and community empowerment, leadership, activism and social innovation. If you're interested in learning more about any of this, please let me know. So to get in touch, to offer feedback or suggestions or to make a financial contribution right now, log on to loveandcourage.org or send me an email to podcast at loveandcourage.org. Thank you so much for all your support. Until next time, here's to you, to all of us and to having the courage to create big change in our lives and in the world around us.